Welcome everyone to uh, another lecture in anatomy uh, and today I would like to talk to you about the anatomy of the thoracic wall and indeed uh, uh, it's two parts so I will start with the first uh, part. So let us define the thorax. When you say thorax that means you are indicating to an irregular shape cylinder as you see here in this figure with a, a narrow superior opening and uh, let us say large inferior opening in which these two openings uh, 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 connect the thorax or the thoracic cavity as you see here with the neck above and with the abdomen uh, below and when you say uh, thoracic wall that means you are indicating to um, let us say two parts skeletal elements and muscles so what you see in this figure is the skeletal element of the thoracic wall the muscles we will uh, leave it to the uh, second part of the um, for another lecture I mean and what you see here is the thoracic cage is the skeletal element of the thoracic wall that means when you say thoracic wall you are getting to the skeletal element and muscles and we will not say all the time skeletal element skeletal element no we can say thoracic cage simply this is the thoracic cage in which if you look to the thoracic cage in this figure you can um, simply uh, summarize the, let us say, the uh, borders of that cage or let us start from anteriorly for example so this cage guarded or bordered or consists anteriorly from the sternum and costal cartilage on both sides okay that's anteriorly laterally it's obviously here you have the ribs on both sides this cage guarded posteriorly or bordered or formed posteriorly by the thoracic vertebrae look at the vertebral column here so look at the thoracic vertebrae here so look at the intervertebral discs in between that means the thoracic cage, what you see here in this figure, consists anteriorly from the sternum and costal cartilage. Laterally, you have the ribs, and posteriorly, you have the vertebral, uh, let us say, thoracic vertebrae and the intervertebral disc in between. And in this figure, you look into the uh, to a natural bone. Again, this is the thoracic cage. Anteriorly, you have the sternum and costal cartilage. Laterally, you have the ribs on both sides. Posteriorly, you have the vertebral. Look at the vertebral column here. Look at the thoracic vertebrae and the intervertebral discs. And this is, let us say, um, anteriorly or anterior view, although we can see uh, a couple of structures posteriorly, but let us have a posterior view of the uh, skeletal element of the thoracic cage. Here, as you see, the spinous processes of the vertebral uh, column, and especially here, uh, I'm going to talk about the thoracic vertebrae. And look at the thoracic vertebrae, how they articulate with the ribs here posteriorly on both sides look at the articulation sides okay so we mentioned that the thoracic cage uh, consists anteriorly from the sternum where's the sternum this is what you see here is the sternum so the sternum you know you can feel it in the midline of your chest so it's located in the midline and we describe it as a flat bone right and it's not one uh, it's not a one piece as you thought it's composed or consists of three elements or three parts you can say the most superior one which is the manoprium 
and you have the body of the sternum itself and you have the xivoid process so you have three elements so let us start with the um, superior part for what we call it manuprium this is the manuprium or you can sometimes pronounce it as manuprium or you can say manuprium manuprium or manuprium is the same so this is the upper part of the sternum and interestingly you know when we talk about surface anatomy you have some time to indicate that this part is referred posteriorly like it's located at which level in respect to the vertebral column so if you take a horizontal plane posteriorly like this and from here because this is the manuprium right so it's located against the third and fourth uh, thoracic vertebrae right and what's most interestingly here if you put your finger up on the manuprium you will feel like a notch this notch we call it the jugular notch this is the jugular notch if you put your finger up all the way above the uh, upper limit of the sternum you will get this notch we call jugular notch or sometime you call it suprasternal notch suprasternal notch jugular notch or suprasternal notch is very important landmark this is about the uh this notch okay now what about the articulation of the manuprium well indeed it has two location or two articulate uh, two articular uh, sides for the clavicles one on the right and one on the left that means what articulates with the manuprium is uh, here we have the clavicle and also you have two locations for the first costal cartilage and the second costal cartilage but not the whole, not completely, the second costal cartilage is not completely, um, uh, it's not completely articulates with the manuprium. It also articulates with the body of the sternum itself. How? Let me explain that to you. So, again, this is the manuprium, this is the jugular notch, this is the articulation site for the clavicle, and here is the articulation site for the first costal cartilage that articulates with the first trip okay now the second costal cartilage has two facets one we call the upper facet and we have also it has the lower facet that means the upper facet of the second costal cartilage here articulates with the manuprium as you see here Right? while the lower facet of the second costal cartilage articulates with the body of a sternum itself okay so these are uh, but also uh, these are uh, the articulations with the um, manuprium but this is not the end because the manuprium articulates with the body of a sternum itself and this is at this very important uh, joint we call it manuprio sternal joint manuprio because between the manuprium and the body of the sternum but we don't use manuprio sternal joint we use something called sternal angle this is the sternum as a whole so this is the angle of a sternum because if you look to the sternum laterally it looks like this this is the manuprium and this is the it's not like this but that means here is the angle, right? This is the manuprium, this is the body of the sternum, this is the avoidable process. So this is the sternal angle. This is the sternal angle, which is very important landmark. Very important landmark. We will talk about it. So we um, described the uh, uh, manuprium, which is, uh, it means the handle right and now let us jump to the body of a sternum this is the body of a sternum it's in the the middle part of the sternum we call it the body and it articulates superiorly with the manuprium at the manuprium sternal 
joint or sternal angle and inferiorly the body of the sternum articulates with the xiphoidal process here uh, at the xiphy sternal joint xiphy sternal joint now this is the first two articulations the sternal angle or maneuver sternal joint and xiphy sternal joint okay what else so the body of the sternum also articulates with the second costal cartilage the third costal cartilage the fourth fifth sixth and seventh so what's interesting here i think i explained that to you in the previous slide you remember the second costal cartilage and we mentioned that the second costal cartilage uh, that of course will uh, articulate here with the second rib right anyway the second costal cartilage has two facets upper and lower the upper articulates with the manubrium the lower facet of the second costal cartilage articulates with the body of the sternum similarly the seventh costal cartilage has two facets again upper facet as you see here and lower facet the upper facet articulates with the body of the sternum itself while the lower facet articulates with the xiphoid process xiphoid process okay what's the xiphoid process yes this is the xiphoid process which is indeed a thin plate of cartilage it's a thin plate of cartilage but indeed uh, the xiphoid process like will become uh, ossified at adult and it becomes like a part with the uh, single part with the body of the sternum and if you look at the xiphoid process it has a demi facet as i mentioned for articulation with the inferior facet of the seventh costal cartilage and as i mentioned because this is the seventh costal cartilage that has two facets upper articulates with the body and lower facet articulates with the um, uh, the xiphoid uh, process and here is you know the xiphoid sternal joint between the xiphoid process and the body of the sternum and most importantly you can well you can uh, palpate your abdomen uh, and go up until you reach this part the xiphoid process and at this level you can tell that the xiphoid sternal joint located almost at the level of the ninth thoracic vertebrae ninth thoracic vertebra you remember again let me remind you that the manubrium located at the level of the third and fourth thoracic vertebrae while the xiphy sternal and sternal angle talk about it it's at the level of intercostal cartilage between the fourth and the fifth thoracic vertebrae at the intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae and here that means three four and here between four and five and this joint what we call xiphy sternal joint at the level of the ninth costal cartilage there is one way to uh, remember it i like always to um, uh, say it in this way how can i describe the surface anatomy of different joints here okay the manubrium at the level of uh, uh, third and uh, fourth thoracic uh, vertebrae while the sternal angle we'll talk about it it's at the level of intervertebral disc at the intervertebral disc that's okay between fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae that means this is the medicinal angle at the level of intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth while the four plus five four plus five that means we start at three four five it's equal to nine nine that means here the xiphysternal joint at the level of the ninth thoracic uh, vertebrae now let us um, describe a little let us talk a little bit about the sternal angle this is the um let, let, let me explain to you uh, a couple of things about the sternal angle this is the sternal angle or for what we call it manuprio uh, sternal joint we do use manuprio sternal joint we use sternal angle as i mentioned here is the manuprium and this is the body of the sternum so it's located here this is the sternal angle 
or the manubrial sternal joint if you take a hor as i mentioned if you take a horizontal uh, line you go back to the vertebral column it's located at the level of intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae that means um, it's very important landmark it is you know why it's important because for many reasons we'll talk more about that in the cardiovascular system but for now it's the beginning of the arch of aorta and it's also the end at this level it's also the end of arch of aorta and also at this level sternal angle it's the bifurcation of the uh, trachea right into right and left uh, uh, main bronchus or what we call it the carina that's located here so also it's important because if you for example if you want to know this is rib number what so you have to go back to the sternal angle you can feel it it's a prominent in some people or if you don't know where is that or you cannot feel it like here it's or there or just put your finger here in the jugular notch which is very clear and obvious here put your finger here and go down a couple of centimeters you reach something like elevated up so this is the sternal angle right because it's like an elevation uh, here so when you reach here that means this is the sternal angle and this is the location of the second trip this is the second trip you now you start counting the ribs this is the second then you feel this this is the third then yes this is the fourth rib sometime you want to go to the fifth intercostal space that means this is the rib number five and you reach that point so we use it a very important prominent landmark to count the reps right okay um now to the uh reps and uh, again this is the uh, you see the thoracic cage and we mentioned that formed anteriorly by the sternum and costal cartilage and laterally formed by the ribs so how many rib we have we have 12 pairs of ribs that means we have 12 um, ribs on the right and 12 ribs on the left that means you have 24 um, ribs right or you can say 12 pairs so they are terminated anteriorly as you see in uh, coastal cartilage and when we describe the ribs it's not just we count them like 24 12 and right and left no we can classify them and just it's a kind of a description uh, we can classify them in, by two ways uh, the first uh, way to classify the ribs we can classify them into um, according to their attachment to the sternum look at the sternum look at the attachment of some of those ribs that means there are like for example number one two three four five six and rib number seven all they are all they are attached to the sternum directly by their coastal cartilage that means they are attached to the sternum that means we call them true ribs that means ribs from number one to seven they are true ribs because they are attached anteriorly by the coastal cartilage directly to the sternum while the from number um, eight to twelve that means number eight nine ten uh, 11 is here and 12 we call them false ribs not true we call them false ribs because they are not attached to the sternum uh, uh, by their costal cartilage directly right and we can sometimes some authorities they um, uh, uh, subdivided the uh, false ribs into also floating ribs be the i mean here we indicate to rib number 11 and rib number 12 if you look at the tip of them you would see that they are not attached to anything anteriorly that means they are floating uh, 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 in the chest that means we call them floating ribs 
we are indicating to number 11 and 12. But anyway, you can also say, yes, 11 and 12 parted from the false ribs because they are not attached to the uh, sternum. Well, just we're describing the how we categorize the ribs. Okay, that means here is the true ribs and here is, guys, the false ribs, of course, on both sides. And 11 number 12, we can say, yes, they are also floating ribs because they don't attach uh, even uh, anteriorly to another like cartridge or so uh, let me just explain one thing again here guys to you in which look at number eight nine and ten yes they don't attach to the sternum direct directly by their coastal cartilage instead they united to each other to form this coastal cartilage and then this coastal cartilage of these three ribs eight nine ten they united or join the it joins the coastal cartilage of uh, rib number seven here right so it joins it um, just to get an attachment, right? While, you know, the coastal cartridge of number 7, as you see here, attached uh, directly uh, to the sternum. Anyway, this is about this classification, according to attachment to the sternum or not, true and false ribs. Now, what about the, uh, according to uh, their uh, structure? What does it mean? It means that we can classify the ribs according to uh, some of features that should be present in, uh, like in uh, uh, in the rib. <coughs> Sorry. So we have typical ribs and we have atypical, or let us say non-typical. So typical um, uh, ribs, they are from number three to nine right while the atypical or what we call them non-typical those ribs they don't have the characteristics of the typical ones those the first two and last three that means uh you know we have from one to twelve so the typical from three to nine that means still we have number one and two and we have number ten 11 and 12 that means the first two and last three they are atypical that means number one and two 10 11 and 12 they are atypical that means non-typical okay the easier way to remember them you can say the first two and the last three just to memorize they are atypical or let us say non-typical okay we describe the true rib and false uh, uh, true ribs and false ribs and we mentioned the floating ribs i don't want to iterate it again so yes as we talk about the other classification the typical and atypical we mentioned that the typical ribs they are from three number from rib number three up to rib number nine that means rib number three four five six seven eight and nine okay what are the characteristics that should be in the rib to say it's a, a, it is a typical rib yani, uh, in arabic we say um what's the what's those characteristics first of all it has to has a head so this is the head of the rib the head of the rib just to uh, remind you that it articulates with the uh, vertebrae in the back right with the thoracic vertebrae in the back so this is the head so the head is posteriorly um, uh, just to uh, keep it in your mind first of all the rib has to have a head and the head has two uh, facets or let us call them demi facets let us maximize it and have a look here so look at the head this is the head of the rib and it has two demi facets so those for articulation with the um, uh, uh, thoracic vertebrae in the back so you have a smaller superior demi facet and you have large uh, inferior demi facets you can call it upper demi facet and lower demi facet right it's not completely a facet a facet is like a complete circle it's sometime it's like not a complete facet like this we call it demi facet 
right? So you have two uh, demi facets, the smaller upper uh, one and large um, uh, and large uh, demi lower demi facet, upper and lower, very simple. And in between, or uh, between these two demi facets, you have a small protruded bone, which is the crest. Look at it here, and look at it here. This is the uh, crest of the head of the rib between the two demi facets. Now, why you have superior or upper and lower demi facets? Where they will articulate? Let us move back and look at here. So, you look and here is the sternum, and here is anteriorly, and here is uh, the vertebral column posteriorly. You look into the right lateral side, right lateral side of the chest. And what is this rib? This is rib number five. This is the fifth rib. Okay, this is the fifth rib. Okay, so the fifth rib, this is the head of the fifth rib. That means this head, it's typical, right? It is typical. That means is it has two demi facets. One is upper demi facet, and you have large lower demi facets. So you have upper and lower demi facets. So rib number five will articulate with thoracic vertebrae number four and number five. So the rib number five or the upper fa demi facets of rib number five articulates with the demi facets of the thoracic vertebra number four. That means the um, uh, uh, typical uh, uh, thoracic vertebra has the typical one, I'm talking about the vertebra now, has superior demi facet and inferior demi facet. So uh, again, this is rib number five, so it articulates with, it is, uh, let me erase this. So it articulates with its upper demi facets with the uh, vertebra above, right? That means it's rib number five, it articulates with thoracic vertebra number four and the corresponding vertebra, the same number, I mean also number five you see here. So by its two demi facets, the upper demi facet um, articulates with the small um, lower demi facet on each side of the vertebra above it. That means this is rib number five. It the superior or upper demi facet articulates with the vertebra above it, which is number four, while the lower <coughs> demi facet, which is larger, it articulates with the also large um, upper demi facet of the side of the vertebra, right? Of the same number, rib number five, with the vertebra, thoracic vertebra number five, with its lower demi facet. Okay. So, this is about the, so always remember that the rib articulates with the, I'm going to talk about the typical rib, arti from three to nine, they, uh, these ribs articulate with the um, vertebra above it and with the corresponding vertebra, right? The same number, rib number five articulates with the four and five, right? This is correct for ribs from three to nine okay what else what's the typical rib should um, have other than the head yes after the head you have a constriction which is the neck which is like flat constricted next to the uh, part next to the head okay what else ah the rib has a tubercle let us have a look from here laterally that means let us move here so again this is the head you already know with two demi facets and this is the constricted part which is the um neck that means okay lateral to it my friends also you can see it from here here is the head here is the neck and here is the tubercle so the tubercle my friends this is the tubercle can be divided into two parts right articular part and non-articular uh, part what does it mean 
Yes, both we call them tubercles. But the tubercles here are uh, divided into two parts. One will be articulated with the transverse uh, process of the vertebra, and one has no articulation with another bone. That means it's just for um, attachment of ligaments, right? So this is the articular um, facet, which is uh, close to the neck, close to the head and neck. We can say, we can call them the medial part because, you know, here is the vertebra, right? That means here is the midline. That means the articular part is the medial one, while the non-articular part is the lateral one. Back to the articular part. You see the facet here? So it has a circular facet uh, that will be articulates with the um, transverse process of the vertebra of the same number. What does it mean? Back here, look at this. Let me use this pen. Uh, yes, look at the rib number five. Yes, it articulates with the corresponding vertebra like number five and with the that one above it, number four. But look at this is the head of the ribs, of the rib, and this is the neck. And this is the tubercle. The tubercle has two parts, the articular part, here you see, and non-articular part. The articular part, you see here, articulates with the transverse process of the vertebra. This is the vertebra, this is the vertebra. So the vertebra, um, each vertebra has transverse process. Transverse process, this is the transverse process. And the transverse process has a facet on it. So like here, right? So, so look at the rib number five that uh, has articular facet. Here, that articulates with the facet on the transverse process of vertebra number five, right? Corresponding vertebra. That means here the articular part that you see here, my friends, with the middle articulated with the circle facet on the tip of the transverse process of the vertebra of the same number, okay? Anyway, now just move a little bit laterally. That means if this is the articular part, here is like, should be or if it is here, look laterally here, this part is the non-articular part, which is lateral one, and is attached to the lateral costal transverse ligament. Yes, you remember the transverse process here. That means the rib should be, um, the rib should be connected to the transverse process by a ligament. This is lateral one, we call it lateral costal transverse, costal from ribs. Transverse from transverse process. So this ligament is the lateral, lateral costal transverse ligament. Okay, so that means the typical uh, rib has head, neck, tubercle, and has also an angle, which is which is the sharp. I would say the sharp point um, to move like the um, rib from the back anterior laterally. Here is the angle, right? Here is the point of the angle. And you have also the shaft. So these characteristics, a plus. Uh, a plus to the, uh, I will uh, mention also more about the characteristic of the first rib, other than the head, neck, tubercle, angle, shaft. Also, it has upper border, you see here, and lower border. And it has lateral surface, listen, lateral or external surface and medial surface, not upper and lower surface. No, the rib has the same look. It's like um, in this shape. It's not a flat. It's a flat, but look at the direction. Look at the upper border and lower border. So look at the lower border also. One of the most interesting feature here in the lower border of the rib you have a small group small groove along the whole rib but it's a very obvious my friends here you can see there is a small groove here called coastal groove the coastal groove uh, is important because um, it creates a kind of um, a protection which is like a space for the intercoastal nerves and 
and intercostal vessels so they pass from there we will talk about uh, them later um, in this uh, in respiratory uh, system right this is the uh, characteristic of typical uh, uh, ribs now that means typical ribs from three to nine what about the atypical or non-typical that means number one and number two and the first two and the last three the last three would be uh, 10 11 and 12 let us have a look on the first rib why is the why the first rib is atypical well it's like C shape the first one and it has not lateral surface and medial surface it has upper surface it's like flat it's like flat um, so it has upper surface and lower surface right and here is the head which um, uh, of course uh, the head here has just one facet you know that typical head should um, has uh, upper and lower demi facets but here the first rib has just um, one facet that articulates with the first thoracic vertebra which is T1 right the first thoracic vertebra so it has also one um, facet not two demi facets okay it has a head and neck and the tubercle but most interestingly my friends yes it has uh, inner border and outer border but as i mentioned it has superior and inferior surfaces let us um see what's uh, the problem also with the first step other than c shape cared have one has one uh, facets on the head and so forth it has very important two grooves look the first one this is the right first rib right so you look into this this is this one right but anyway look at the features here and look at it here so this is the first strip and look it's you know that uh, already articulates with the uh, manubrium right anyway look at the upper surface of the first rib it has two very important grooves grooves on the bone the first anterior one which is for subclavian vein you see here this one is this one is the location for here is the subclavian group for subclavian vein posterior to it you have another groove which is for subclavian artery you see the sub groove for subclavian artery in between you have a rough area for attachment of the muscle in between here that means the subclavian vein and subclavian artery they are separated by a muscle we call it scalenus anterior scalenus anterior here is the attachment of scalenus anterior muscle that you see here right so also you can see here here is the first um, rib and has two grooves on its upper surface the first anterior groove for subclavian vein and the posterior one for subclavian artery and in between there is a rough area for attachment of a muscle called scalenus anterior muscle that you see here that separates the vein anteriorly from the artery posteriorly right also um what's behind here the artery is the location of the or uh, where we have here the lower trunk of bra brachial plexus you see this one the lower trunk of brachial plexus that you see uh, here posterior to all of these trunks you have another rough area right which is not for scalenus anterior no it's for scalenus medius right where is that this is the let me erase it look here is the scalenus medius right so if this is the rib so it has a rough area here for attachment of scalenus medius right i don't care too much about that it's like more too much details but if you have a look like just anterior to the neck you know here is the head and neck of the first rib here is the t1 vertebra in the back but just anterior to the neck you have two nerves and two vessels so from medial because this is medial from medial to lateral you have sympathetic chain and i like to jump here the 
T uh, ventral ramus of T1 nerve root that passes here, and you have the uh, what do we call it, the um, intercostal vein and the superior intercostal uh, artery, right? So jump to the second rib. Uh, uh, in the second rib, still, uh, it's a flat, right? It has upper surface, lower surface again. Um, yes, it has two demi facets for articulation with the uh, the same number. This is rib number two. That means articulates with thoracic vertebra number two and with the T1 as well. It has an ich, yes, it has tubercle, but it has, um, why it's atypical also, it has a tuberosity on its um, uh, upper surface here, which is a tuberosity for serratus anterior um, muscle. Yes, we mentioned the serratus anterior here. Look, this is the serratus anterior between the subclavian vein and artery. So it has a tubercle here on the first rib, but also it has also attachment to this to the second rib as well. So serratus anterior originates here, or it has attachment to the not just the first rib as you see here, but also to the second rib as you see here, right? So the attachment from the first and from the uh, second. Now the uh, now the atypical also we mentioned the last three number 10, 11 and 12. So number 10, the rib number 10, why it's atypical because it has a single articular facets on it his head because you know it, it should has two demi facets but it's atypical because um, uh, it has just one facet on its head. That means it articulates with only with vertebra number T10. It's a number, rib number 10. So it articulates just with thoracic vertebra number 10, not with also T9. Because you know, the typical, the typical rib should articulate with the same number and the, the vertebra above it. No, it's just with number 10. Also, now to the uh, 11 and the 12, the floating uh, uh, ribs. Uh, so also they have only one facet similar to the number 10. That means number 10, 11 and the 12, they have just only one facet on the head. And uh, they have, but uh, uh, number 11 and 12, what I want to summarize, uh, what I want to say, let us summarize it. They don't have, I would say, most of things that's related to the rib. So they, they have just one facet. They don't have neck. They don't have a tubercle. And even you don't see like a sharp, uh, really angle, especially in number 12. Although you can also hear a little bit. But they are floating ribs. They don't attach anteriorly to anything. That's why the kidneys that's located here um, are more prone for injury, especially when there is a case of falling down and there is like a um, uh, fracture for any of those um, ribs because, you know, the rib when it's fractured, it becomes like a knife. So uh, the kidneys like um, become more prone to be like injured. Before um, digging deep into the uh, uh, thoracic vertebrae that um, form the um, posterior part of the thoracic cage, let me give you uh, a brief general idea about the vertebral column um, as a whole. So, uh, first of all, you are looking to the vertebral column anteriorly here and laterally um, here. So, first of all, you know, the vertebral column, you can say it's com uh, uh, composed from uh, 26 uh, vertebrae, or let us say 26 irregular bones, because we consider the uh, vertebrae as um, irregular bones, right? So, some people can say, no, it's not 26, they are 33. 
yes, both are correct, but it depends if you talk about uh, the uh, sacral bone and coccyx before or after the fusion. So, indeed, those uh, uh, vertebrae, uh, they are 24 plus the sacrum, if we consider it one, and coccyx, if we consider it one, that means we have a 26, that's correct. Or, uh, that's of course after fusion of the uh, five sacral vertebrae and four uh, coccygeal ones. So, um, if before the fusion, that means the sacrum has five and coccyx composed from four. That means 24 plus 9 equals 30. Three. So now this is the vertebral column, 26 irregular bone, so it contains four distinct curvatures. When you look, if you want to see the curvatures of the vertebral column, you have to look uh, to the vertebral column from laterally. That means you have four, that means you have one here, you have one here, you have one curve here, and another one here. That means you have four. We'll talk about them. So, in general, you know that the vertebral column uh, transmits the weight of the uh, trunk to the lower limb through the hip, of course, and inside it, there is a spinal cord uh, that's uh, protected um, there, and also it provides a kind of an axial support for the trunk itself. So, these vertebrae you see here, separated by intervertebral discs, We'll talk about that. And the vertebral column, not just to protect the spinal cord and uh, 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 the role of uh, wear bearing, but also it's a site for attachment. If you see from previous slides in this lecture, attachment for the um, ribs and for the muscles as well. And you know how much they are important to protect the uh, structures in the thoracic cavity and to support the back and so forth. Uh, this is uh, uh, just uh, about the uh, just a brief introduction, but let me uh, show you here is the location of the uh, uh, curvature here. So you have this cervical curvature, this one, right? So let us uh, let, let me show you that the first this is cervical one. This is the thoracic uh, uh, one. Or thoracic, let's say thoracic curvature, and here is the lumbar curvature, and here is the sacral curvature plus with the, of course, with the coccyx. So, how many cervical vertebrae we have? We have seven from C1 to C7. That means you have seven cervical uh, vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae, we have 12. We have 12. Lumbar, we have five, and sacral, we have five fused, uh, so we deal with it as one piece. And coccyx, you have also four fused, they fuse together to form just one uh, uh, piece. So the cervical, um, let me say that all of them are uh, movable, although the most movable structure is the cervical and the lumbar thoracic you know it has limited uh, movement and the coccyx is like the uh, generous part and it has like um there is a normally limited movement between the coccyx and the sacrum indeed and you know here is the coccyx usually moves slightly forward or backward as the you know pelvis hips and legs move right so that means finally we have seven cervical vertebrae you have eight thoracic you have five lumbar and you have let us say the sacrum and coccyx very simple and i showed you the curvatures again back to the curvatures if you look to the uh, to the fetus so at the first the vertebral column as you see here is like a c-shape in relation to the back it's uh, convex, right? So it's convex. All pieces, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, so they are convex related to the back. But with a further development, and once 
the uh, baby after birth starts to um, after lifting the head and start the baby moving his, his right and left up and down so the cervical curvature now started to form and what else you have also the lumbar one once the baby start to move his legs and move and walk and so forth in a bright position so the curvature at uh, the lumbar curvature started to appear look once you once the baby started to move his head and start to walk this convex vertebral column now um, would be chained that means it will no longer be like convex like c shape no at the beginning the cervical will be like concaved of course related to the back cervical will be concaved and here is the lumbar will be concaved right it is the lumbar that means um, relative to the back the cervical let me show you here the cervical and the lumbar in relation to the back they are concave right look at the concavity here look at the concavity here while the uh, thoracic and sacral they are convex of course related again to the back right here is what we do and this indeed gives the um, uh, increase the spinal resilience right by these uh, curves so for that reason uh, my friends we call the uh, thoracic and um, what we call it sorry and for that reason we call the cervical and lumbar curvatures we call them secondary curvatures the cervical and lumbar that I talked about here that they formed after the baby started to move his head and walk now we have two curves lumbar and uh, uh, sacral uh, sorry um, cervical and lumbar so they formed and we call them secondary because they formed later after the movement of the head and the walking right while the let me change the color while the thoracic curvature and the sacral curvature we call them primary curvatures because they already they are already present at the time of the birth and they didn't chain right so maybe again yes we said that the cervical and lumbar they are secondary they formed later after birth but indeed it can be disappeared right the cervical and lumbar curves are non you know as secondary because they begin to form later but several months yeah i mean several months after birth but um maybe progressively can be like lost in old age because again because of kyphosis and so forth so back again the vertebral column like uh, returns back to be like c uh, uh, shape right uh, we cannot skip the general features of the uh, vertebrae in general so uh, any vertebra uh, we expect to um, have uh, these things so the typical vertebra guys when you say typical vertebra that means um, um, must um, has these uh, like body uh, should also have the uh, arch here we call it vertebral arch because this is an arch right and you say arch it's composed from two parts the pedicle here and the lamina here that means you have pedicle here lamina here right so pedicle uh, anterior right connects to the body that means the vertebra again should uh, have the uh, body uh, vertebral arch including pedicles and lamina plus vertebral foramen for the spinal cord here right to the spinal cord and what else you also the vertebra should have seven processes processes that means something protected outside so you have a spinous process posteriorly two transverse processes one two three and 
it should let me raise these uh, things to show you these seven processes, right? This is a as a process, two vertebral processes. That means we have a three now till now, and you have uh, what we call it articular processes, a small process with a facet on it. This process, this is a process with a facet, and this is a process with a facet. You look into the uh, to the vertebra from above. This is a video view. That means these are superior articular process with a facet here. Superior articular process. That means inferiorly, if you flip the vertebra up, you will get also two processes similar to those, right? We call them inferior articular processes, right? That means you have uh, one uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven. That's below, right? So let me explain to you this, uh, what we call this pattern. We call it interlocking pattern. Interlocking pattern, it's a term used to uh, describe. Now you got idea about the general characteristic of the vertebra that it should have uh, superior articular process and inferior articular process. So, for example, in T9, the inferior articular process articulates with the superior articular process of T10. The inferior articular process of T10 articulates with the superior articular process of T11 and so forth. This, the superior and inferior articular process, they articulate with each other from the vertebra above and from vertebra below to lock that um uh the, to lock that uh, space there and form that uh joint right uh so um if you uh look in here my friends look at the game the body and we mentioned we have processes and if you remember we said here look at the let me erase it and remind you of this Look at the body and you see these are bidicles, right? These are bidicles. So there is a notch here and there is a notch here and below as well. So look at the body here and look at the bidicle here. This is the bidicle in which there is a notch here and there is a notch here, right? So bidicles have notch superior vertebral notch very simple and inferior vertebral notch so the for example the uh, uh, say for this say it's t for example 9 and this is t 10 right so the inferior vertebral notch of t 9 and the superior vertebral notch of t 10 or here for example the inferior article the inferior vertebral notch of T10 and the inferior, no, sorry, the superior, the inferior of the inferior vertebral notch of T10 and the superior vertebral notch of T11, they you know are opposite to each other when they uh, when the vertebra above the other, so they form like intervertebral foramen. That means this foramen formed by these knots from the vertebra above and below by their knots, the superior and uh, the inferior and superior one. So they form the intervertebral notch. So the spinal, you know that the spinal cord in the vertebral foramen here, this is the location of, um, let me erase it again and use another pin. So you know this is the vertebral foramen and there is a spinal cord here it does here now there is a spinal nerves moves from here and from there on both sides so this point of a clavicle that have uh, that has sorry notch it creates a kind of intervertebral foramen through which the um, spinal nerves you see here there is a spinal cord in the vertebral foramen and from the inter uh, from the vertebral foramen from the intervertebral foramen we we call it inter Sorry, why we call it intervertebral foramen? Because it's between the ver between the vertebrae, right? Between this vertebra and this and so forth. So they are intervertebral foramen. So this intervertebral foramen, uh, foramen, sorry, 
uh, is an exit for the spinal nerve. You see the spinal nerve moves out, right? Um, here is like written vertebral canal. We call vertebral canal or ver vertebral foramen, right? I mean this. You can call it vertebral uh, foramen or vertebral canal. It's up to you. Now to the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae, as you see here in this natural uh, thoracic vertebra here in this in this illustration, well, my friends, can be classified uh, uh, depending on the articulation with ribs. What does it mean when you say the thoracic vertebrae um, divided or classified according to their articulation with the rib? That means we have to memorize the ribs and the typical and atypical ribs and how they articulated and then what i want to say now that we have a 12 thoracic vertebrae and again they are classified because of the related attachment to the ribs into typical and atypical again it's like ribs right so if you remember the ribs we classified them into typical uh, that was uh, ribbon from 3 to 9 and a tibical were the first two I mean 1 and 2 plus the last three that means 10 11 and 12 so uh, typical ver typical ribs here we talk about it just I'm trying to remind you you can go back to the beginning of the video anyway so that means there is a minus one here in which the thoracic vertebra the typical ones the typical ones from the second vertebra to the eighth vertebra right and the atypical the atypical is the just the first one and the last four that means 19 11 and uh, the 12 uh, vertebrae that means you have typical and a typical thoracic vertebrae and the typical from uh, the second to the eighth ones and the atypical um, is the uh, first one and last four we will understand i will show you how i will uh, let you understand why uh, the typical from second to eight and why the atypical uh, is the first one and last four but First of all, uh, let me uh, explain to you the general characteristics and features of the typical ones, the typical thoracic vertebra. If you go to the thoracic vertebra, if you look superiorly here, you know, this is the body, and these are bedicals, let me remind you, and these are lamina and or lamini and the spinous process transversal process superior uh, uh, articular uh, process and of course inferior you have the inferior articular process so you know these are general features for any uh, vertebra right that we see here but the thoracic vertebra the typical thoracic vertebra uh, uh, should um, has the body as you see here and the body is like medium size and it's like heart shape i mean you know the heart shape which is like um, approximately it's like the heart shape right and on each side if you look laterally yes this is the typical thoracic vertebra this is the body and it's like medium in size and it's like heart shape why heart shape because if you go down to the lumbar vertebrae the body is like kidney shape but if you go up to the cervical vertebrae the shape of the body is like flat and the brought from side to side okay let us leave it for now because i would like to focus today on the thoracic vertebrae the typical ones so hard shape medium size and on the lateral side of the uh, uh, body of the thoracic uh, vertebra you will see you have demi facets for articulation with the ribs you know that the ribs articulate with the just thoracic vertebrae that means we need on each side of the body two demi facets two demi facets one is up the upper one and a smaller one if you remember um, that uh, the rib for example say this is t4 uh, so if you have for example rib 
number five so rib number five will articulate here and so you know the rib has two the typical one right has two uh, uh, facets the upper one and lower one so the upper facet of the rib say this is rib number five right so it articulates with the um, vertebra above that means t4 and with the same number of vertebra here which is number five by its um, uh, inferior demi facet right so that means you understand why uh, if you go back also in this lecture you understand why i'm talking about and you know that you have large upper demi facet which is for articulation with the head of the rib of the corresponding uh, number for example rib number here is uh, this is thoracic vertebral number four that means this is the rib number four in which with two demi facets the lower one of the rib the lower the lower demi facet of the rib number four articulates with the upper demi facet of the t4 the same number right okay what about the upper demi facet of the rib uh it will be with the vertebra above three right anyway that means the rib number four or the same rib articulates with the same number of the vertebra t4 uh, uh, the rib by its inferior demi facet and the vertebra by its upper demi facet that's large and we know that in the rib this one is the large right okay now what we have else other than body and demi facets right upper and lower Oh yeah, we have a transverse process because typical thoracic vertebra has to articulate with the rib through the transverse process as well. And so, yes, we know that there is transverse process, but at the end of transverse process here, there is um, what we call it a facet. We call it transverse process facet or the facet of transverse process. This is for articulation with the articular part of the tubercle of the of the corresponding of the same corresponding number that means if this is um, vertebral number four so the rib uh, uh, so the rib number four guys should articulate here right this is number four so you know that you brickle of the rib you can go back in the lecture at the beginning you understand what I mean when I say the uh, articular um, uh, the tubercle the articular part of the tubercle articulates with the facet of transversal process with the same number right okay what else look at the spine the spine of the transversal process here is like long and here also if I would raise this and I will show you here is the transversal process so the transversal process is long and directed downward and backward while if you look to the vertebral foramen here also you will see it's like circular if you go up in the cervical vertebrae it's like a train angular mainly in shape if you go to the lumbar you will also kind of um, triangular but the the vertebral foramen of the thoracic vertebra is like circular and small now look at the superior articular process this is the superior articular process like a satellite right so they are directed directed backward and laterally look at it here backward and laterally but the inferior articular processes they are opposite they directed not backward they directed forward and medially on both sides right so this is these are the characteristics of the typical uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae now why the first thoracic vertebra and the last four thoracic vertebrae are atypical okay let us come to the t1 this is the t1 ah it has not upper and lower this is t1 huh? why you look the body has not upper and lower demi facets no the body has complete circular facet and 
the lower demi facets. We are okay with the lower demi facet, but should be here. Typically, you know, it should be like demi facet, not complete. Why? You remember the first trip, and we mentioned that the first trip. This is the first trip. If you go back in this lecture, and this is the head of the first trip, and the head of the first trip has not because you know it should be it should be two demi facets but the first rib has just only one facet on its head that's why also it's atypical anyway the facet the circular facet of the first rib articulates with this complete facet of the t1 right and you know typically typically it should be the rib you know the rib should articulate with the same vertebra and the vertebra above it but in this case the first rib articulates it has just one facet so what it has to do it has just to articulate with the complete facet that matches its uh, facet on its head that's why the t1 vertebra has one complete facet and demi facet now the demi facet here is for what uh if this is vertebra number t1 and here is the um, vertebra, let us say, T2. That means the T2, say, it has a demi facet here, right? Upper demi uh, facet. And you know, it's typical, right? T2 is typical from 2 to 8. They are typical vertebrae, right? Anyway, that means the second rib that comes here you know, this is the second rib, and we mentioned that the rib should articulate with the same vertebra and the vertebra above it. So it has two demi facets here. So demi facets. So one with the T1 and the second one with the T2, uh, right? Now to the last four uh, vertebrae, why they are, uh, as we mentioned, atypical so let us start let us divide them into uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae number 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 so uh, we got idea about t1 now to uh, let us uh, uh, see why thoracic vertebra number 9 and 10 for example let us have a look to the thoracic vertebra number 9 yes it has body and everything the process and so forth and Yes, but here the body has only just superior demi facet. Where is the inferior demi facet? Oh, there is no inferior demi facet. Why? You know that uh, the the rib number we have uh, rib number ten. Ah, that means there is no location for rib number um, ten to articulate here because we know that each rib articulates with the same number of the vertebra and with the vertebra above it. That means, let us back again to the thoracic vertebra uh, number nine. So it has just superior demi facet. It's for what? For rib number nine. This is the rib number nine that has two demi facets, the inferior one, two. This is rib number nine so the inferior demi facet of the rib articulates with the superior demi facet of the same number of the vertebra and the demi facet of the rib the upper demi facet of the rib articulates with the vertebra above it right you you know this is t8 right and this is why t uh, uh t9 i mean thoracic vertebra number nine is um uh, atypical okay what about t10 t10 you remember what uh what are typical reps Re let me remind you that typical reps from three to nine that means that means rib number 10 is atypical it is not typical why because the head of it has only one complete facet it's not two facets no the rib number 10 has only one complete facet it's for what ah it's just for articulation with this complete facet on the t10 thoracic vertebral number 10 so that means thoracic vertebral number 10 has only just one complete circular facet and it has no inferior demi facet right 
that's why it is which is for articulation with the facet of the rib number uh, 10 okay what about the thoracic vertebra number 11 and the thoracic vertebra number 12 uh, the body also similar similar to the t10 you remember t10 is just one facet also the t11 has only a complete single facet for articulation with the same uh, number you know uh, rib number 11 and that has only also one facet on its head and also the number 12 you know rib number 12 also has only one facet for articulation with the single facet on t12 that means thoracic vertebrae number 11 and 12 they only just has they only just have sorry uh, one facet on their uh, body and look there is no there is a transversal process yet but there is no facets on the um transverse uh, processes uh there right for articulation with the uh, same rib right so that uh, guys about the uh thoracic uh, typical and atypical thoracic uh, vertebrae and regarding the uh, most common ligaments that um, located mainly in the thoracic uh, uh, region uh, we have here for example a couple of uh, we have a couple of ligaments that hold the vertebral column in our right road position and it's a clear here look at the thoracic vertebrae here and um, uh, say uh, the, this is the body of or the bodies of the vertebrae so there is a ligament broad ligament here a strong broad ligament anterior to the vertebral body and there is another one which is really like cord structure directly behind the body that means you have a ligament anterior directly to the body and one posterior di directly posterior to the uh, body so there's one the long one this is the anterior longitudinal uh, ligament it's a broad and strong and it prevents the hyper extension prevents the hyper extension while for example if you move back uh, your back back right so on the other hand just directly posterior to the um, body of vertebrae you have another longitudinal uh, ligament which is not anterior it's indeed posterior because posterior to the body so right so we call it the posterior longitudinal ligament yes it's smaller than the anterior one because it's like cord like structure if you see here here is the anterior my friends and here is the uh, you see the posterior which is like cord like structure it's weaker than the anterior that's fine but it prevents the the hyperflexion the hyperflexion right you just imagine how you do a flexion and it prevents the over or hyperflexion right so it passes posterior to the surface of vertebral bodies and if you dig deep here look at the vertebral uh, canal here or what we call it vertebral foramen right so the posterior longitudinal ligament it forms and the anterior surface of the vertebral canal or vertebral foramen right because it's anterior because it's posterior to the vertebral body directly but still it's anterior to the vertebral uh, canal or foramen so it forms the anterior wall of it okay what we have other than the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments yes we have if you move away from the back here away from the body sorry um, uh, to the back look at these processes so there is a ligament um, between the tips of the spinous processes this is the spinous process spinous process and so forth so between the tips of spinous processes here you have this ligament we call it supraspinous ligament supraspinous ligament not interspinous it's supraspinous because it connects the tips of spinous processes right the tips of spinous process we call it supraspinous ligament now between the spinous processes themselves here this is called interspinous interspinous that means you have supraspinous 
and interspinous uh, ligament on the other hand we move a little bit anteriorly from spinous process you have the lamina here so between the lamina here of the above and below vertebrae you have ligamentum flavum ligamentum flavum these ligaments which is uh, passes between the uh, lamina of adjacent vertebrae and indeed it forms the posterior surface of the vertebral canal the posterior you remember who's the anterior the anterior this is the vertebral canal the anterior the ligament that forms the anterior wall of it is the posterior longitudinal ligament while between the lamina here between the lamina here you have the ligamentum flavum that forms the um, uh, posterior wall of the vertebral canal uh, there right remember this is the intervertebral foramen not vertebral canal right you go back in the lecture then you will get an idea about uh, the what I about the vertebral canal or vertebral uh, uh, foramen right okay um, Now, uh, shifting back to the intervertebral uh, discs and the uh, the vertebrae here and the intervertebral disc in between, right? So, for example, this is a this is a, a real um, cadaver you see here, and there's a cross section through the lumbar vertebrae. Anyway, lumbar or uh, thoracic, it doesn't matter. We want to get the idea about the. I want to get. I want you to get the idea about intervertebral disc. Here you can see the um, intervertebral uh, disc through the sagittal section, and the discs, as you see, is like uh, thick. Uh, here like this cross-section from the lumbar area so in the lumbar area and in the cervical area up in the neck the uh, if you notice that the intervertebral disc is a little bit thicker uh, than those in the uh, thoracic area but anyway why because it too um, uh, there is a lot of movement there and you need to improve the flexibility anyway so the disc uh, provides uh, uh, compressibility of the spine and resists the uh, tension of the uh, spine uh, any extra pressure on it can lead to flatten it and sometimes it gets like herniated uh, to the uh, vertebral um, uh, canal right herniated to the back so if you take a cross section uh, or if you look to the uh, 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 intervertebral disc here superiorly you will find it's it's like a, a circular kind of circular shape it takes the shape of the um, uh, of the vertebrae uh, where it's located there and it's composed from two parts this outer part and inner part the outer part we call it annulus fibrosus this is the annulus fibrosus in which it's in uh, blue color so this is the annulus fibrosus even the annulus fibrosus itself can be um, divided into outer ring and inner ring the outer ring from collagen here and the inner ring is like mainly fibrocartilage right now um, the let us move a little bit to the second part here in the middle which is uh, indeed called nucleus pulposus it's in the middle so we call it nucleus but the outer one is annulus because annual that means like a circle right annulus fibrosus from its name it's mainly from fiber the outer one right should be strong to include the gelatinous mass here the inner one that's called nucleus pulposus the gelatinous mass its function is to absorb the combustion between the uh, uh, vertebrae look at it here so in case if there is extra pressure the the uh, nucleus pulposus can be herniated 
to the vertebral canal as you see here this is a herniated we call it herniated disc and it creates a pressure either in the spinal cord itself or in the uh, spinal nerve related there so in this MRI of sagittal um, uh, uh, sagittal lumbar area so this is a problem area sagittal section so this is uh, let us say this is a lumbar uh, vertebra here and in between you have intervertebral disc look at the intervertebral disc here is like intact and it's normal this is the vertebral canal in the back or vertebral foramen right vertebral because you know vertebral foramen 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 all together they form vertebral canal so this is a vertebral canal in which there is a spinal cord and cerebrospinal fluid anyway look at this which is uh between uh i would say l5 and s1 the sacral because this is a sacrum right so look at the intervertebral disc it's like herniated in the back and it creates a kind of a pressure on the spinal cord uh, and uh, coda equina right look it creates a kind of pressure here so this is we this disc we call it herniated disc in which the nucleus pulposus herniated to the back right lastly uh, I would like to to show you uh, the joints that uh, uh, form because already we um, covered the ribs and the uh, thoracic vertebrae and you know the close relation and the articulation between ribs and thoracic uh, uh, thoracic vertebrae so of course there are a couple of ligaments and a couple of joints there they are pretty easy and direct forward when you say uh, the articulation between the ribs and the thoracic vertebrae of course you are talking about synovial uh, joint and you know from the previous what we mentioned earlier in this lecture that the head look at the two facets of the head the head of the rib you know that the head of the rib uh, for example say this is number five so it articulates with the body um, uh, of the thoracic vertebrae number four and number five and you know the head of the as i mentioned i will just repeat it again that the uh, head of the rib has two facets uh, or demi facets one is the upper one and the lower one you know that the lower facet uh, articulates with the uh, same corresponding uh, vertebra and the upper facet articulates with the vertebra above it that means with number thoracic vertebra number four and we discussed that in details earlier and also we mentioned that the rib has other than the head and neck it has a tubercle a tubercle you know it has two parts articular part and non-articular part and you know that the articular part here of the rib it has a facet and this facet for the articulation with the transverse process of the same vertebra that means this is a thoracic vertebra number five say for example and this is the transverse look at the shadow here the shadow behind the rib this is the transverse process for example this is thoracic vertebra number four look at the transverse process the transverse process has a facet here and also number five has a transverse process and facet here but rib number five will articulate with the transverse process of the same vertebra that means there is articulation again between the rib and the vertebra in which through the head and through the uh, articular part of the tubercle so we uh, uh, a typical rib articulates with the vertebra as i uh, as written here uh, you know the uh, body forming joint with the head of the rib and transverse process for what we call it costo transverse joint we'll talk about each type of uh, these joints anyway both are synovial joint which type of synovial joint they are they are um, plain synovial joint right and mainly their function uh, especially in the upper uh, ribs to uh, like uh, it uh, allow it allows them to rotate and while you move down to the lower rib uh, it gives them like an ability to move up and down especially this is very important during the breathing you know that the chest should be like inflated and deflated so it, it should move right
now the joint or with the head of the rib to the um, uh, uh, vertebrae uh, there already I explained uh, that to you but let me show you here we exposed that joint and let me iterate again this is the uh, rib say for example number five that means it articulates with the upper demi facet here of vertebra number five the same number and with the lower demi facet of the vertebra above it that means number four anyway look at the joint here in which the demi uh, the rib has upper and lower demi facet and so each one you know articulates with the corresponding uh, part and look inside the joint itself you remember the crest of the um, head of the rib this protrusion this protrusion of the head of the rib called the crest of the head of the rib it connected to the disc by intraarticular ligament let me erase it and show you here so simply let me change here is the crest there is the crest of the head of the rib so it's connected by intra articular ligaments this is a small ligament called intra articular ligament connects the crest of the rib to the intervertebral disc anyway look this intra articular ligament divided the cavity there into two compartments right two synovial compartment anyway the whole joint my friends because synovial that means it's surrounded by a capsule right joint capsule right so this is the uh, part of the uh, uh, the um, what we call costo uh, costo vertebral uh, joint, the part with the head, right? Joint with the vertebral body. Now we finish this. What about this? The costo transverse joint again a synovial joint, as you know, and as I mentioned earlier before two slides that. Uh, this joint between the do you remember the tubercle of the rib you can go back and watch it so there is a tubercle for the rib one articular part and one non-articular part so the articular part has a facet here for articulation with the facet of the transversal process of the same vertebra that means this is rib number five this is um, uh, vertebra number five so this is a there is a this is the transversal process of the uh, of the vertebra number five right so again here you can see here is the um, uh, articular uh, part of a tubercle of the rib and here is the transversal process and you know the transversal process has a facet here for articulation with the tubercle of the rib so this is not the end of the story of this kind of joint for what we call it cost transverse joint Costo, you know, costo because of the rib and transverse because transverse process. Costo transverse joint stabilized by extra, uh, by two extra capsular, uh, <coughs> two extra capsular ligaments. The first one, my friends, is like uh, or two or three. So look at the uh, rib here. So this is the head. This is the neck. So very simple. How to memorize it? First of all, what's the name of this joint? It's cost transverse joint. That means the first one between the neck and the transverse process, it has the same name, cost transverse ligament. Now, you remember we said that the um, tubercle, the uh, tubercle of the rib has articular part and non-articular part laterally this that you know the articular part has a facet articulates with the facet of transversal process but the non-articular part of a tubercle it connects to a ligament and to the transversal process right this is the and we call it uh, to like distinguish it from the costo transverse ligament we call it lateral one lateral costo transverse ligament right this is the lateral costo transverse ligament. So the same name. Also, we have another one, but um, uh, indeed from the neck, but up, right? Here is, you can see it here from the neck of the rib, but up, it attached the neck of the rib to the, um, uh, to the transverse process of the vertebra above it. We call it not lateral, no, we call it superior because here is the lateral. 
here is the superior costal transverse ligament that means all of them they have the costal transverse ligament but one you know the costal and one lateral and one superior right and you know where they are now um, you know that the sternum uh, articulates with the um, uh, first seven costal cartilage right and this joint we call it uh, sternocostal joint this is the sternocostal joints here what you see here so it's between the upper seven costal cartilage and the uh, sternum very simple but there is a one exception here my friends the first trip or you know you know after a while this will be uh, ossified and calcified uh, why because it's not synovial the first strip is not synovial because the kind of joint here the joint i mean between the first strip and the manuprium is a cartilaginous joint it is cartilaginous joint the name uh, we call it you know fibrocartilage uh, fibro cartilaginous joint or you can say cartilaginous joint so it's not synovial it's fibro cartilaginous joint what about the rest no the rest are from the second to the seventh they are synovial joint and they have a thin capsule they have a thin capsule uh, of course enforced by the same name uh, a similar a small ligament carries the same name so we call it sternocostal ligament sternocostal uh, ligament here if you need to dig deep more in that joint just the second one the second one uh, it has like two compartments you see you know why because it articulates with the meliprim and with two demi facets right with the uh, one with the um, uh, manuprium and one well, with the body of the serum itself again we have the last two joints my friend between the manuprium and the body of the sternum and between the body of the sternum and the process and we explain that area but the joint between the manuprium and the body of the sternum we call it manuprio sternal joint this is the manuprio sternal joint right and the joint between the body of the sternum and the photo process we call it xiphi sternal joint right and which kind of joint they are they are fibro cartilaginous joint fibro cartilaginous joint which type of fibro cartilaginous joint symphysis right so that means it permits a little bit of movement for example the manipro the manipro sternal joint it allows just only slight angular movement during the respiration while the xiphysternal uh, joint it becomes like with time it becomes like ossified with age right sometime during the cpr um it's a prone to be like uh, it's prone for fracture right um, I would like to show you like a couple of uh, clinical examples uh, which is uh, related to the curvatures of the vertebral column and uh, look at here the lateral like there is increase in the lateral uh, curvature or something called scoliosis right this is an example of scoliosis on the other hand it's like uh, let us say as like as shape right so on the other hand um, uh, or you can say sometimes C uh, shape anyway this is scoliosis while in the elderly people here it's common to have or even like in teenagers those not sitting in a proper position most of the time so they they, they get like more increase in the thoracic curvature uh, here something called kyphosis we call it kyphosis right on the other hand if there's increase in the lumbar curvature here we call it lordosis we call it lordosis and it's mainly common in the pregnancy during the pregnancy and uh, those um, are overweight
Okay, here's the spina bifida. There is, uh, I would just, uh, I will uh, remind you that there is um, a full lecture about the spina bifida and uh, uh, which is part from the development of the imperiology uh, of the nervous system or I think, yeah, development of the spinal cord. There is, yes, full detailed lecture about the spina bifida. But anyway, there is a defect. Just remind you that there is a defect in the vertebral column here in the lamina. They are not fused and so forth. You know, there are a couple of um, types of spina bifida and so forth. So I prefer to uh, watch the development of the spinal cord in the same channel and get more details about it. Uh, here is just uh, give you a hint about the x-ray so it can be posterior anterior you have to order it posterior anterior or anterior posterior for example if you want to have a look um, to the anterior um, uh, uh, ribs and you want to check the anterior pain or entry clearly you ask the posterior anterior x-ray right posterior anterior that means the beams will come from the pack and uh, the plate will be close to the anterior surface because you want to have a look to the anterior um, uh, to the anterior uh, uh, ribs and also if you want to have a look to the size of the heart you ask for posterior anterior because the heart will be very close to the plate and will not be enlarged right but you get a correct idea about the size of it anyway the anterior posterior the beams come from the anterior and the plates close to the posterior rib so you ask for anterior posterior x-ray if you want to get more clear more view or a uh, clear view about the posterior rib or posterior uh, injury look at the size of the heart he is like so large because it's anterior posterior this is not correct so here's again you can post the video and uh, watch slowly for the shadow of the trachea here and most importantly the rib look at the shadow of the first rib here this is the shadow of the first rib look at the shadow of the second rib follow it right follow it although the second one is not that much clear but you can watch it right let us have a look to the third one so this is the third one so it's better to follow the shadow in the back like one two and this is the shadow of the three the third sorry and this is the four and this is the shadow of the fifth rib and this is the shadow of the sixth seventh eighth ninth and here is the tenth you know usually the technician um, ask the patient to take a deep breath why in order to lower the diaphragm right to lower the diaphragm why we need to lower the diaphragm to see the rib number 10 this one right rib number 10 right so um in this case for example let me show you where this is again the vertebral column and here is the first rib you see the first rib here this is the first rib right and this is the second trip right and so forth anyway look at the fracture here in the first trip on the other hand look at this child uh, he's right and uh, here is the um, lift anyway this is the clavicles scapula here forget that look at the uh, first trip here here is the first trip here is the second one here is the third one here is the fourth one and look at the fracture on the fifth one look at the fracture here on the sixth one and the fracture here in the seventh one okay if this is the first strip look at the first strip here the shadow of the first strip this is the shadow of the first rib, right? Look above the first rib, there's a kind of an extra rib here. You see, like horns. This is the cervical rib. This is an extra rib, right? It attached to the 
uh, cervical vertebra number seven, the last cervical vertebra, and the projected up and, um, you know, uh, using x-ray shows the cervical rib as a small horn like structure and usually fibrous bands here commonly extends from the anterior tip of small cervical rib here above the first rib and it creates a kind of a pan we call cervical band but you cannot see it on x-ray right um, so the cervical uh, rib that I mentioned sometime, you know, because above the first rib, we have subclavian veins, subclavian artery, and the brachial uh, plexuses, right? Brachial plexuses. So uh, sometimes because of extra rib or because of a trauma on the clavicle here, repetitive trauma can cause like um, the distance between the clavicle above and the rib below like becomes like narrow that means there is increase in the tendency to uh, compress the um, vessels and nerves there so uh, this compression we call it thoracic outlet syndrome thoracic outlet uh, syndrome. So this this syndrome caused, uh, as I mentioned, there is abnormal compression of brachial plexus and subclavian vein and artery, and uh, between the clavicle above and first rib, um, usually like uh, the sometimes the uh, uh, blood vessels compromised uh, under the pressure and impair there is impairment in the circulation to the upper limb, plus. Um, some patients lie because there is compression in the lower trunk of the brachial plexus creates a kind of a numbness and pain down the medial side um, of the forearm and hand and wasting the uh, small muscles of the hand ultimately. So that was about the thoracic cage, the skeletal element and we explained in details the thoracic cage and the sternum anteriorly and the um, ribs laterally and the vertebral column uh, thoracic vertebrae i mean the articulations joints clinical correlations and uh, hope you find value in it thank you uh, so much and these are our references thank you